Hi everyone, thank you for joining me on this talk on how to refactor an existing monolith to serverless in eight steps. If you've been reading about the serverless and the companies that are using them, you might have heard about the success stories some of these companies have had with serverless, such as iRobot, Lego, The Zone, Basel, and so on. And you might have heard about how serverless can be more scalable, more secure, allows you to go faster and still build more resilient systems and be cheaper as well. And you might be thinking, and you might be thinking, well, I like the sound of that. It's like having the cake and eating it. And I very much like to be where those companies are. But at the same time, it all seems very far away from where I am currently, where I'm working with monolith systems that are running on EC2 or maybe even on-premises hardware. The good news is that it doesn't have to be that difficult. I was exactly where you were a couple of years ago when I was working at a social network where I inherited a monolith application with a long list of scalability problems and features used to take months and months to deliver and be able to transform the whole situation within six months with a small number of developers, including myself. And none of the other developers at the time had any prior experience with AWS, let alone serverless. But we were able to get moving very quickly. And within six months, we transformed the whole organization and the whole infrastructure. And even though cost was never our goal, we also realized quite a nice cost saving and save about 95% on compute compared to what we were spending on EC2. But the main reason why we went to serverless was that it allowed us to move fast. We were able to go from taking months to deliver a feature to taking days on average. And in some cases, we were able to discuss a new feature, make the change, test it and deploy that into production all within the same day, within a matter of hours. So my name is Yen Chui. I am a AWS serverless hero and I've been a long time AWS user for over 10 years now. And as I mentioned, over the last couple of years, I've been working very closely with serverless technologies, including at Yabo, that social network, where we did that whole transformation within the six months. Nowadays, I spend half of my time working with Lumigo as a developer advocate. And Lumigo is a troubleshooting platform for serverless applications. And the other half of my time, I spend as an independent consultant, working with companies from all around the world in all walks of life, from stealth mode startups to multinational enterprises, where I provide a variety of services, including training, consulting, and also sometimes deliver features for my customers. In whatever spare time I have, I also like to produce content in terms of blogs, and also produce some video courses. Some are with Manning, others are self-produced, such as my new course, Learn You Some Lambda Best Practice, which you can enroll by going to lambdabestpractice.com. And I've also started a new podcast as well called Real World Serverless. And give us a listen on realworldserverless.com. So back to the topic, the rapid transformation I achieved at Yabo with my team is highly replicatable. And if I'm honest, everyone can do it. There's absolutely nothing special about me or my team, but you do need to create an environment where the success that you're looking for is allowed to happen. Many organizations who have transitioned successfully from monolith to microservices use a technique called reverse Conway's maneuver, which is named after Melvin Conway's observation from 1967 that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those companies. When organizations who refuse to change the way they operate adopt serverless and expect everything to just magically go faster, sooner or later they come to the crushing realization that technologies alone is not going to solve all of the cultural problems that they have. If anything, these technological advancements often brings those underlying cultural problems to the surface. If all of your feature teams depend on a centralized ops team to release their work because they are the only ones the company trusts enough with access to the company's production environments, then doesn't matter how fast the feature teams are able to move by adopting serverless, the whole organization can only move as fast as this centralized operations team and they become a massive bottleneck for the company. In fact, the faster the feature teams go, the worse the problem becomes. Before, you might not have realized you have such a big bottleneck because the feature teams just weren't moving fast enough to create enough work for the centralized ops team for the pressure to be felt. 
And oftentimes when I see this, the argument for this setup is that, well, my developers just don't understand AWS and how our infrastructure is set up there. It's great because now you have identified the root cause problem. That is a problem that you can actually address. The key thing to keep in mind here is that your developers are going to be making the architectural decisions anyway. The ops team can't possibly know and understand everything the feature teams have built and how can it be respected to support a system that they just don't understand. And if they are solely responsible for the system's uptime, this is going to lead to pressure and pushback against changes the feature teams want in order to move the products forward. So essentially, you've incentivized your ops team to slow you down, which is the opposite of what most companies want. So instead, invest in your developers, upskill them, and make them responsible for their system's uptime. The single most effective way to improve a system's uptime, even more so than using serverless, is to put your developers on call. And the reverse Conway's maneuver says that you should structure your organization to match the software that you intend to produce. And if you want to produce software that are made up of small, loosely coupled components that can be deployed and scaled independently and can fail independently without affecting each other, then what you need is to have small autonomous teams that can innovate and move quickly and be able to fail in isolation. And your job as a decision maker, as senior management, is to empower these teams so that they can do the best work possible. And it's fitting that in probably the best book about engineering team culture by Patty McCord, who used to run the HR function at Netflix, one of the first things to talk about is how to organize their culture to give people their superpower back because they already have the superpower. And what happens in most companies is that the processes and bureaucracy just gets in the way of people being able to use their superpower to do their best work. That said, you also don't want the wild, wild west. So instead of having a centralized ops team that holds the key to the kingdom, invest into monitoring and automation and apply guardrails so that you can trust the developers but verify what they do. The SIE model is really useful here where you can embed experienced ops engineers within your feature teams to help upskill them and to help set the team up for success. And again, your job as a leader is to provide guidance and context so that the teams understand the constraints that they're working within and can make the best decision possible. And your job is not to create an environment of centralized control and gatekeeping so that nothing moves without you saying so, and in doing so, making yourself a massive bottleneck in the organization. And one thing to consider when you are forming these teams is that you want to align your teams with the problems, not the solutions. The solutions change all the time. The problem domain, however, it doesn't change all that often. And if you're working within a large organization, don't let everybody all start at the same time, especially when it comes to adopting a new paradigm, a new way of building systems like serverless, because everyone is going to run into the same problems along the way and all have to make the same mistakes and learn the same lessons, which is just terribly inefficient. Instead, find the pioneers and settlers within your organization. Those are the people who are good at exploring new ideas and are not afraid to fail over and over as they go into this uncharted territory and allow these teams to create a small success story and lay out a path that others can follow so that they don't have to make the same mistakes again themselves and accept that your teams do need to skill up, ask for help, give them the training they need and the time they need to experiment and grok the new technologies that they have to work with and the new way of working as well. There are many of us in the service community who are very happy to help out. So if you reach out to people like me, Ben Cahill from iRobot or Jeremy Daly on social media, on Twitter, we are all very happy to go and help you guys out. And Jeremy Daly has got a really nice newsletter called Off by None, where he collects all the content from the community and share with everyone on a weekly basis. Step two is to start identifying those service boundaries within your monolith. And this is where you pay to play safe and dip your toe in the water rather than jumping in. And I think it's really useful to start with having a mind map of your application, all the different components that makes up your business, and start the migration with those low risk non-critical business processes first, and then use the strangler pattern to incrementally migrate the legacy monolith by gradually replacing pieces of it and moving them to the new system. Looking at the mind map I had for Yabo, the social network, 
we have lots of features, including the timeline feature, which works very much like what you defined in other social networks like Twitter and Facebook. But then there's also other features like search, notifications, suggestions, chat, and so on, that all evolve the number of entities in the system, such as user, location, content, relationships, and so on. And all of these are useful starting points for identifying those service boundaries within which you can use the most appropriate technology to implement those services. For example, to store the relationships between users in a way that makes it easy to do more complex queries, like finding second or third degree connections. You may want to use a graph database such as Neo4j or Amazon's Neptune database. The important thing to keep in mind here is that services should be autonomous. They should have clear boundaries to their responsibilities and probably most importantly, they should own the data that they need to operate on. You don't want to be sharing databases between different services as you will create a single point of failure in the whole system where if the database is having an issue, all of your system is going to go down. It also means that none of the services have authority over the data that they're supposed to operate and own. And that's the recipe for a distributed monolith with all the problems of a monolith and all the challenges of a distributed system. And you also want to make sure your services are loosely coupled together through shared contracts, which can be applied to APIs as well as events and messages. One important thing to avoid here is the so-called entity service anti-pattern, whereby you may be tempted to put everything that evolves around a user into a single user service encompassing everything such as searching, creating, fetching users, registering users' relationships, having chats between different users, all of which are different problem space that involve the user entity. Instead, you should model your services along those verticals of problem domains such as search or relationships. And as you identify those service boundaries and start to implement those replacement services with serverless, you also need to figure out how to organize your code into repositories. And one mistake I've seen a few people do is to think that, well, Lambda functions can be independently deployed. Therefore, each Lambda function is a microservice and therefore I need to put each one of them into its own GitHub repo with its own CI CD pipeline. And of course, this approach just doesn't scale as you end up with hundreds, maybe thousands of functions and repos and pipelines. And just because the Lambda function can be independently deployed and scaled, it doesn't make it a microservice per se. A microservice is about the boundary of its responsibilities. And we're still thinking in terms of services, which can consist of multiple functions depending on what makes sense as a boundary context for that particular microservice. The two approach that works is either having a mono repo where all of your systems are put into the same GitHub repo and you may have a folder at the root for every single service, which can have its own set of Lambda functions and other resources. And that allows you to share code easily between different projects using symlinks and using bundlers and a Webpack, which resolves them at deployment time. And that you have a CI CD pipeline, one CI CD pipeline that deploys all the services in parallel. This approach works well, but it runs into trouble when you have about 100 to 150 engineers, at which point you need some really good tooling and automation to make Monorepo work. Google, Twitter, all these big tech companies, they all have a sizable dev tooling teams to help build those automation and guardrails so that they can continue to work with Monorepos. And I'm guessing that most of you don't have that much resources thrown at this problem. So this monorepo approach is great for small teams and for startups where maybe you just have a small handful of engineers working on the code base. You can get all the benefits, but none of the drawbacks. And who knows, maybe with serverless, your developers are so productive that you never need more than a handful of them anyway. So you're just never going to hit those problems that monorepos have. The approach that I normally go with is to have one repo per service. Within that service repo, you will have all the functions that have to work together as part of that service. So your engineers are split into different teams and the different teams will own one or more microservices, which each are consist of Lambda functions as well as other resources they need to work with, such as API Gateway, Kinesis, SNS topics, and so on. And you have one CI CD pipeline for every service 
that deploys the functions as well as any other resource that should be deployed as part of the same service, including its own databases. For anything else that can be considered as shared infrastructure, such as VPCs, subnets, and things of that ilk, they should belong in a separate GitHub repo with its own CI/CD pipeline and deployment cycle. And you can share information about those shared infrastructures, such as ARNs for VPCs or VPC IDs, and store them in CloudFormation outputs or as SSM parameters so the different services can reference them easily. And in this case, you share code through shared libraries that you publish to NPM, Maven, NuGet. And in some cases, depending on how much you need to make sure that the same business logic is applied consistently across all of your services, you may also have to look at turning some of that shared code into its own service instead. I've got a blog post here that explains the difference and trade-offs between the two approaches. The most important decision point is who should own the deployment cycle for updates. If it's the consuming service, then this should be deployed as a shared library. If you need to ensure consistency across the entire system, then consider making this a shared service instead. And step four is to pick your tools. What deployment framework to use, uh, what tools to use for CI, CD, monitoring, and so on. And almost everybody asks me, what is the best tool for CI? What is the best tool for deployment? But I really don't think there is the best tool for doing anything but you can pick the best tool for you based on how you like to work. And I would say just stick to it. The most important tool you would have in your toolkit is the deployment framework. And this is where you've got lots and lots of choices. And I wrote a blog post a while back that compared many of these deployment frameworks along the axis of how customizable they are and how opinionated they are. The most important thing here is don't write your own deployment framework. Is exactly the kind of undifferentiated heavy lifting that we want to get away from with serverless. And rather than using lots of different tools within the organization, try to stick to one or maximum two so that you can maximize the amount of knowledge you have about this tool within your company and make it easier for you to onboard new people and for people to move between different projects. Next, you're writing your functions and you want to keep them simple. And it's important to remember that what got you here is not going to get you where you want to go next. For example, it is possible to take a whole Express app and run it inside a Lambda function, whereby when HTTP request comes in as from the event, we find out the path, the HTTP method, and so on, so that we can route those requests to different methods within our code. And this is what I would call a monolithic or a fed function. Where's the idiomatic way to do things in serverless is to have single purpose functions. So in this case, we will have a different Lambda function for every single endpoint and method. And when you compare the two approach side by side, as you can see, you end up with more functions when you have single purpose functions, but it's just as easy to find related functions by prefix if you're using frameworks such as the serverless framework or SAM, which imposes a naming convention that makes it easy for you to find related functions because they all have the same prefix. And by looking at these related functions, I can quickly figure out what my function can do. Whereas with the fat function, I will have to look into the code to figure out, okay, what are all the different business capabilities that we have that is provided by this single function. And also when you have different endpoints and different functions, they may want to do different things and require different IAM permissions. And if you have just one function that does everything, that means you also need to give that function a very broad set of permissions, which of course violates the golden rule in security, which is the principle of least privilege, where you want to give your software components the least amount of privilege necessary. And furthermore, when you've got different functions that does different things, they may need different dependencies. And uh, if you have a fat function that does everything, for example, you may have API that does some service are rendering with React, but then there's also just lots of RESTful endpoints that returns JSON. So the fact that you have one function that does everything means that you have to always initialize those dependencies. And when you look at a cold start time for a Lambda function, for many functions, the biggest contributor to the cold start time is the initialization time, which is how much time it takes to initialize your function module. And a big part of that goes towards how much dependencies you have. So having more dependencies is going to mean that you have a worse cold start performance. And all this is to say that single purpose functions is going to give you the best discoverability, security, 
and performance when it comes to cold starts. And now that you've built your new replacement services with serverless, we need to think about how to migrate to these new services. So as a starting point, you have your monolith where everything resides and then they're all talking to some monolith database as well. And as you extract functionalities from the monolith and put them into its own services, each with its own database, ideally you want all the other functionalities from the monolith to start talking to this new service. But you don't want to do this in a big bang fashion because it's risky and requires a lot of coordination. So instead, to do this more gracefully and safely, you can extract the code of the functionality into a new service, but still talking to the same monolith database. And once again, start with the least critical component and make it talk to this new service instead of talking to the database directly. And gradually, you also migrate other components that need to access the same data to go through this new service until everything that needs to access the same data that's owned by this service will now go through this new service. And at that point, you can start thinking about introducing a new database rather than having to go through the same monolith database and whilst you could do this without downtime, if your system is able to tolerate a small downtime where you can do the data migration and everything, then you should take advantage of that. Alternatively, if that's not an option and you have a system that needs to be up 24 seven, then consider the following approach, where essentially you're gonna turn your new database as a read through and write through cache. So anytime you need to read the data, you're gonna check your new database first. If it's not there, then you're going to read it from the monolith database and then save the data into your new database that's owned by this new service. And every time you do a write to the monolith database, you also do a write to your new database so that the next time you can find the data from your new database without having to go through the monolith. In the background, you also want to kick off a one-off migration job to make sure that all the data are copied over from the monolith database to your new database that's owned by this service until eventually you can deprecate the relevant tables in your monolith database because the new service has all the data in its own database now. And as always, the context is very important here. For a startup, I would suggest just do the simple thing and take some downtime and get it done as quickly as you can. But for an enterprise which values stability and uh, needs to mitigate its risk, then this approach is going to take longer and more effort, but you'll be safer and without having to require downtime on your systems. Another thing to keep in mind is that as you introduce replacement services and you need to iterate on them, how do you maintain API compatibility? I've seen multiple versioning schemes using versions in the URL path, in HTTP headers, in query string parameters, all of them suck. And I think the best thing you could do for yourself is to not introduce any breaking changes if you need to rename a field, then instead of doing that, you will introduce a new field with the new name, but keep the old name as a separate field and then gradually deprecate that over time as other services migrate to use the new field. And also it's important that when you got more and more services, many of which depend on each other to minimize the number of synchronous data transfers via HTTP requests and instead try to synchronize data between microservices. So imagine if you've got multiple systems, some of which depend on a shared service for some piece of data. System C in this diagram is a structural weakness. If it goes down, all the other services would go down as well. And this is what we call a cascade failure, whereby a single failure in the system can bring down other parts of the system. And instead of doing this, what you could do instead is allow system C to publish events whenever stage changes happen and those events can then be consumed by other systems and they can take a copy of that data in their own database. And they don't have to take everything either, only the information that they need in order to serve their requests. So that way, when system C goes down, other systems can still find the relevant data they need from their own database. However, one exception I make for this is when it comes to user identifiable information. If you got those information about your user copied and synchronized everywhere, then it becomes really hard for you to follow the GDPR regulations, whereby if you need to tell the user all the different places you have their data and it's being copied and synchronized everywhere, then you have a much tougher job on your hands. And the same goes to, you should never record PII information in your logs because that's another common blind spot. 
we also have to change the way we think about testing. Traditional wisdom tells us that we should have lots of unit tests, a few integration tests, and even less acceptance tests. However, given that most lambda functions are very simple and they have a single purpose, the risk of something going wrong has largely shifted to how our code integrates with other services. And your unit tests are just not going to catch these kind of problems, especially if you're using mocks to abstract away all those integration points. And I think fundamentally, you need to think about testing differently when you're working with Lambda. Because if all you focus on is what goes on inside your Lambda function, and you're using mocks and stops on all external services that you integrate with, then most of the problem that can actually go wrong at runtime, you're going to miss them. And your test is going to give you false positives. Things like incorrectly set up IAM permissions, maybe there are syntax errors in your DynamoDB query, or misconfigurations on API Gateway. Your unit tests are not going to tell you any of these things. And just because all of your tests are green, it doesn't mean that you have working software. It just means that you have passing tests. Nothing more, nothing less. And it's my strong belief that as software engineers, we need to optimize towards working software, not just the speed of your feedback loop. It's an important ingredient, of course, but it's not the goal. A fast feedback loop that tells you the wrong thing is just going to help you learn the wrong thing faster. And for that, I tend to avoid any local simulation in terms of using things like local stack. I do invoke the function locally, but talk to the real AWS services. So for example, I will use serverless frameworks support for invoke local, but I will talk to the real DynamDB tables or other AWS services to make sure that my integration with those services work exactly as I expect. I will not use local stack to simulate DynamoDB or SNS or any other AWS services locally. And when I write my tests, I tend to write them at a very high level so that they're not so coupled to my implementation. So for example, for API endpoint, I would say, when I hit this endpoint, what do I expect as a response? Rather than checking whether or not I've made the right call to DynamoDB and so on. And in this case, I'll run my integration tests by invoking the code on the CI server or on my local machine, and that will talk to the real AWS services, such as DynamoDB, SNS, and whatnot, to get good confidence that my code actually works. And then I will deploy, and once it's deployed, I will have an API endpoint or some SNS topic, which I can then interact with to trigger the same code, and again, talking to the real AWS services, so that I can check the whole system is working end-to-end. And in this particular case, to make my test cases more reusable, I tend to write them in such a way that I will have a test step, say, when we invoke, say, the get endpoint. And then in the definition for that, when module, I will check an environment variable. And depending on the value, I will either invoke the function locally or I will invoke, say, the deployed HTTP endpoint. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't tend to use mocks for AWS services, and I try to use the real services, except when I need to test those failure conditions, which are often difficult to trigger and simulate in the real AWS environment, in which case I would use mocks and stops. However, unlike AWS services or other SaaS applications, my own APIs, they tend to be more volatile, especially in those dev and test environments where they can often break. So for my own APIs, I do use mocks during my integration testing just because I don't want a case where one team will publish a change to their dev environment, breaks the API, and then everybody else that depends on that API will now be blocked because none of the tests will pass and they can't do deployments. And for end-to-end -end tests, you should take advantage of the fact that you can deploy a fresh temporary stack every time you need to run your end-to-end -end tests so that you don't have to worry about all this test data getting into your shared test or staging environment that you need to have some other process to clean them up on a regular basis. And if you're using asynchronous event sources like SNS and Kinesis as part of your application, and you're wondering how do you include those in your end-to-end -end test to make sure that your application is publishing the right messages, then have a look at this blog post where I outlined a couple of different techniques where you can bring them into your end-to-end -end tests. And finally, you need to think about resilience. And probably the most important thing here is to think about how are you going to get observability into your application so that you can detect when things go wrong quickly and react to them and figure out what the problems were. 
and when you have different services try to use queues to amortize any traffic spikes so that if one service experiences a spike in traffic it doesn't pass all of that traffic onto another system which can often cause cascade failures where huge parts of your application goes down because one single service experiences a massive spike in traffic and when you have distributed transactions in your application try to use sagas which you can implement using step functions and to prevent retry storms and other forms of cascade failures use circuit breakers so that when a system is struggling you don't keep on hammering it and make the situation even worse and in order to isolate and minimize the blast radius of any issues which can include security compromises try to use bulkhead which often can be as simple as just using different AWS accounts for different teams and different environments so that any compromise to one account cannot spread out to another environment and this is very useful in terms of dealing with those regional limits as well and while you get a lot of built-in resilience with Lambda which deploys to three availability zones out of the box you can go much further with a little effort by going multi-region active active and that's my eight steps to migrate an existing monolith to serverless by first applying reverse commerce maneuver to structure your organization to match the software that you intend to build and then to start identifying those service boundaries within your monolith figure out how you can organize your code whether to use mon repos or have one repo per service and then pick your tools for deployment for ci cd for monitoring and so on and as you start writing your lambda functions keep them simple which is going to give you the best security and performance as you migrate those features from your monolith into new services have a plan to migrate to them gracefully if need be and rethink how you go about testing these new services and don't just follow the beaten path and write lots of unit tests with lots of mocks and stops they do not give you the return on investment when it comes to serverless and lastly think about how your systems can fail build resilience against those failure modes i want to thank you guys very much for listening to me today and before you go i want to tell you about some of the work i've been doing as a consultant where i provide training advice as well as occasionally working on projects for my customers and if you want to work together go to the burningmonk.com slash hire me to see how we may be able to work together and this year i'm also running a number of in-person workshops which covers everything you need to learn about to build a production ready application at the time of recording there are still spaces available for the workshops in helsinki stockholm dublin amsterdam london and berlin and as a token to thank you for joining us today hit the discount code that can get you 10 percent off any of these workshops and i also run this workshop as in-house training where we can be more flexible in terms of the dates and i'll be coming to your office instead of you having to travel and once again thank you very much if you have any questions please feel free to contact me i'll be online to answer any questions you have